psychology and ethics, and I don't have time for all that stuff. They don't want to line their life up in every area. You know that. You know you have a hard enough time doing it, and you know those people aren't doing it. They're not working hard on it out there. You're sitting here in a church where you get a message four times a week, and they get a miracle or two three times a week, and you know you're talking about two different categories of people. Some people, a lot of them, no doubt, are genuinely converted and saved because I remember my early days, and you remember your early days. You didn't know a whole lot, and you were insincere in a whole lot of matters in your life, but yet you had a true work done in your heart by the Lord. It took time to grow. I guess that's the whole point I'm trying to make. You don't grow by watching miracles happen. You grow whenever you get under the Word. But anyway, going back, skipping over all the other stories I got off into, going back to what I was telling you, Anna Schrader was, was the very one with this prophecy, and although perhaps part of it has come to pass, and people could say, well, the rest of it's conditional, and I can accept that, the point of the matter is they did know each other, not only know each other, but she was the one who prophesied over him that, that quote, gave him, unquote, and I don't mis misconstrue that, that gave him this ministry. I know only the Lord can give a person a ministry. But, I mean, that was the initial beginnings of it all. And it included, oh my, it included, if you listen to enough tapes, you can put it all together, ministering in huge stadiums to vast numbers of people. Hmm, now I wonder where somebody got that idea. In huge stadiums to vast numbers of people. I find that whenever the apostles asked the Lord a certain question, that it implied a certain understanding behind the question of theirs and they just wanted to make sure that it was right lord are there few that be saved why would they even ask a question like that why would they even ask one unless they'd already picked up from him only few will be saved you know when you look at the parable of the sower and the seed in in mark chapter 4 in matthew 13 you find four cat four categories of people and three don't make it it wouldn't take too much teaching like that for you to end up with the idea in your mind. I guess that means only a few are going to be saved then. You know, the birds of the air, that rocky path, and those thorns and thistles and briars all chokes out the word. And there are some that receive the word in an honest and good heart, another gospel writer says, it's fertile soil, and they bring forth fruit, some 30, some 60, and some 100 fold. And Jesus said, take heed how you hear. Few be saved? Yeah, few. So there's part of the prophecy. Thousands in vast stadiums and auditoriums and people would be coming to the Lord and miracles would be done. And well, that didn't happen. Another was that he would meet the Lord by a well of water. And it was a literal well. You see, the prophecy had different things. One was a spiritual application that he would be drawing forth spiritual water from a spiritual well, the Word of God, and feeding people dying of thirst. And that certainly did happen under his ministry. I was one of those dying of thirst was fed some of that water. But there was another application, and it was also stated in the prophecy very clearly. This isn't my interpretation of it. That one day, and it was implied it would be in the future because he would forget about it. And so you kind of take that as it implies that it would take, and he said this, that it would take probably a long time, long enough for it to get in the back of your mind and memory so that you kind of forget about it so that one day you're walking by a well and maybe it can happen because that was a part of the condition of that prophecy being fulfilled, that, that he would forget about it, and one day he would be by a well of water, a literal well of water, maybe in Bethlehem or who knows where, and the Lord would appear to him and talk to him. That never happened. Now people are trying to put new interpretations and say, well, somehow that refers to the afterlife, or Dr. Freeman is going to resurrect bodily from the dead so that that can be fulfilled. And those sound to me like kind of extreme ways of getting around the fact that we have an unfulfilled prophecy on our hands. Now you can say that conditions had to be met and conditions weren't met until the prophecy wasn't fulfilled and I can buy that scripturally. Or you could say that there's some things in the prophecy that aren't even of God. Listen, didn't the Bible, didn't my Bible, didn't yours, let me just check out and see if yours reads the same, that if a prophet gives a word and it doesn't come to pass, then, does it, then the Bible doesn't try to put a lot of blame on other people or their circumstances or conditions of fulfillment. It says if a prophet gives a word and it does not come to pass, you are not to be afraid of that prophet. 
Why? Obviously, they have not spoken the mind of the Lord. They prophesied out of their own heart, or they prophesied by an evil influence. That's Deuteronomy 13 and 18, by the way. So it's not like people can say to us, well, you're just being so harsh, and we've got to have some type of reliable criterion and standard to stand upon, friends. And God didn't want Israel, since she was a spiritual people, and he included the miraculous in her midst. He didn't want her to be so open and gullible to that with them saying, well, since we're spiritual people and God intends the miraculous to be in our midst and I just, we have to be open to everything, he didn't want them to be that way. He wanted them to have the miraculous but have a way to discern between the true and the false. And so here is one test, a very easy test, the test of historical fulfillment. And guess where you'll find that test, and, and I say this with, with admiration, in Dr. Freeman's big book on the prophets. That's one of the tests of a true prophet there, the test of historical fulfillment. Now, you see, what I, what I find to be real slippery is whenever we say that word for everybody else out there, where Oral Roberts gave a word that God appeared to him, Jesus, and said he's going to build this hospital and find a cure for cancer. None of that came to pass. Well, he built the hospital, and he closed it down, too, this year and did not find a cure for cancer, as though Christians haven't already found a cure. I don't know what he's looking for one for, but he didn't find a cure for it. Well then, what does the Bible tell us to do about a person like that? Reject all that business. We'd reject it on other grounds anyway. But there's one ground, the lack of historical fulfillment. And so our groups reject all of that. And the Jehovah's Witnesses predicting the date of Christ's return and that didn't happen and so we reject all that and we mock at them saying well look at them it didn't happen so the day after it didn't they begin to reinterpret it saying well we didn't really mean he'd come to the earth it meant that he would enter his heavenly sanctuary and we kind of we kind of uh, are suspicious of that that you never would have thought of that until your prophecy didn't fulfill itself and then you had to come up with that interpretation and then what do we do in our own groups You know, I intended the silence there, friends, because one thing I've, I have a big concern about, I know that God is a God of truth, and in him there is no lie at all. And, and God is not pleased with people. He's not going to deal well with people who continue to live in lies and multiply them. I want to show you a verse. We may not look at a whole lot of these. I can tell we're not going to get where we thought we were tonight. We'll do that maybe next time. This is all necessary, though. I want to show you something over in 1 Timothy chapter 4. <clears throat> see if you can't see some type of application in this, since it is a prophecy that Paul gives us from the Spirit that will concern itself with the latter times, times in which we know that we live. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. Now Paul tells us there that we're not fighting, that these doctrines and so forth, we're not fighting men. These are evil spirits that are influencing men with erroneous doctrines. And Paul said, that's what will cause people. You know, we live in such a secularized society today that even Christians have a hard time really practically, functionally believing in both the existence of angels and demons. But the Bible says they're real. Jesus took them as real. The apostles took them as real. And we better if we're going to get anywhere today. And where these ideas are coming from are not from men. Paul says these are demons and spirits giving these ideas Obviously, the demons aren't talking themselves. They are influencing men who are influencing people to apostatize from the faith. That's the word in the Greek, depart from. And look at this next phrase here. Those who depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies in hypocrisy, and having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Well, I just want to wanted to point out to you the first thing there in verse 2. Speaking lies in hypocrisy. You know, hypocrisy, pretending that it's one way when really it's another way and you're lying about the whole matter. I find that, that phrase, speaking lies in, in hypocrisy, 
right in the midst of this context dealing with latter times departure from the faith, which may be, it's got to be, at least part of what we're seeing happen around us right now. I mean, you did sing before I stood up here tonight that you're soon going to see the king. If you really believe that, then, then what we're seeing right now in our own experiences has to be at least part of the fulfillment of 1 Timothy 4.1 and following. Or then you don't really mean what you're singing when you say soon we're going to see the king. Speaking lies and hypocrisy. Listen, why not just face the fact that Mrs. Schrader gave a prophecy that did not find fulfillment and according to the Old Testament and the New for that matter, test for prophecy you're to reject that people get all syrupy over this because it's a prophecy about me well can't we accept the good parts and reject the just reject it why well, have to base something if dr freeman's ministry bless you then just let it bless you that doesn't have to be based on some woman's prophecy the prophecy didn't happen friends god knows what he's talking about he's not going to give a word that doesn't come to pass I have big problems with that. People don't like the fact I have problems, but they have problems with me because I have problems. So we all have problems. We all have problems with other people. This is in the Word, friends. This isn't my idea or my bias. This is in the Word. This is Deuteronomy 13 and 18. Now, I can hear people as clearly as I'm talking to you. They're, they're thinking. They'd never say this because they know it's contrary to the Word, but they've been so influenced by this pluralistic, smooth-talking spirit where you're trying to have your cake and eat it too. They're saying, well, I think you're just being a little bit too legalistic with that business of prophetic fulfillment. But you know what my whole question is? How can you be too legalistic? Either it comes to pass or it doesn't. There aren't any gray-type areas. Either it does or it doesn't. And God said, if it doesn't, then reject it. I have not spoken by that person. I did not send them. See, God had a supernatural Old Testament people, but he had to, it was because of that fact that he had to guard against delusions and deceptions. You know, if you're not a supernatural people, or we don't serve a supernatural God, or we're not called into a supernatural ministry and work, then there's no need to guard against all these things. It's because of that very fact that we are in a supernatural work and ministry and walk and warfare that God doesn't want us to be gullible. He wants us to receive visions and dreams, but it's because he wants us to receive visions and dreams, he doesn't want us to receive them from the wrong source. It's God's care and protection of us. It's for the very... Uh, this ought to be so obvious to people. It's for the very reason that we are supernatural people, that God is concerned that we guard against being gullible for all of these delusions around. So whenever he gives us a test that a four-year-old could understand, if it doesn't come to pass, forget it. And then we've got our people saying, well, now, it didn't come to pass, so let's see, could that maybe refer to heaven or... That sounds like some self-serving interpretation to me, friends. That's as neat and as nifty as what the Jehovah's Witnesses did with their prophecies of the second advent. Well, we must have misinterpreted them. They don't ever blame God, you see. Well, we must have put the wrong, and the real interpretation was he entered the heavenly sanctuary and blah, 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 blah. That's not what the prophecy of the Jehovah's Witnesses was. It was the date of the second advent, and it didn't happen. So those self-serving liars had to find some way to keep the flock and to keep the people following them. So they attached a new interpretation to it. You know, friends, I don't find the true men of God, the prophets in the Old Testament having to do that. Man, whenever they prophesied something, they just said, here's the way it is. They would give a name like Josiah by name, the prophet of 1 Kings 13. He had to apologize later and say, well, really, I meant Jeconiah. I just got the pronunciation wrong. It was Josiah by name. And several hundred years later, Josiah was born, became king, and did the very thing the young prophet in 1 Kings 13 said that he would do. Those guys didn't miss it. They didn't guess around and with their own feeble minds and, and uh, attempts to think, well, if this is happening now, then any wise person can tell this might be what happened in the future. They didn't get in. They just believed God. God gave them a revelation, and they spoke, and it came to pass. 
That's always how you would know. Or it was one way how would you, you would know. It's definitely a way you would know that the Lord did not speak by them if it didn't come to pass. What do we have on our hands? A lying God who tells us something and lied and didn't really come to pass? Or whenever you read Isaiah, he prophesied that there was going to come a king and he gave his name and everything. Isaiah 44 and 45, the end of one chapter and the first half of the next. Isaiah chapters 44 and 45, Cyrus by name, that would set the people of God free. Set the people of God free? They weren't even captive yet. They hadn't even gone into Babylonian captivity. See, people talking about a restoration of prophets and apostles, we better have them on that order. I'm not following them. I'm not following somebody who gets it eight out of ten times. So if we mean a restoration of prophets, they better be like they were back in the good old days. They spoke the word of the Lord. They didn't say this is my word. They said just the opposite. Thus saith Yahweh. And this will come to pass as surely as I stand here. Remember what old... <laughs> Elisha said there was a man who doubted his prediction of a great blessing that would come shortly. The king leaned on the Lord's hand here, and he said, you'll see it, you'll see it, but you won't eat of it. Wow, now how could you ever have figured out that he would be the one standing in the gate of the city whenever the people rushed in and out to collect all of the goods of the enemies when they fled, and he would accidentally, quote-unquote, get trampled to death. Elisha just said, here's the way it's going to be. You're going to see it with your own eyes, and you will not partake of it. And that's exactly what happened. Or whenever in 2 Kings 5, uh, that was, I guess, chapter 7 and 8 of his prophecy. In 2 Kings 5, old Gehazi snuck behind his back. Well, where have you been, Gehazi? Where have I been? I haven't been anywhere. Went not my spirit with you when you went back there to Naaman and asked falsely under lies and pretense for all of this selfish greedy gain of yours well you can't really say now that you didn't because he knows he's caught red-handed well that leprosy that was upon Naaman will cleave to you and to your descendants forever well then you can all you gotta do is just stand there for a few moments and watch him turn white and he did so people that give prophecy that don't come to pass friends and you know all of us working in simple gift of prophecy well you know that just means you miss God and people have missed God in simple gifts. So it, it becomes heavy, big-time material, though, friends, when you claim to be a prophet or a prophetess and doesn't come to pass. The rest of us have to struggle and learn to listen to God. When you're a prophet, then that, that's what you are. You're a prophet. You're not a practicing prophet. You're not one who's learning the trade. <laughs> that's what the rest of us are doing. We're learning the trade. You're allowed to make mistakes. When I say allowed, I mean it still has to be judged, but... Nobody says, hey, I'm never going to follow you again. But if Isaiah starts predicting prophecies of this, that, and the other, and it doesn't come to pass, and the next day it doesn't, and then a third prophecy he gave, and it doesn't, then I, I, I can't follow him anymore then. I can't keep excusing it with self-serving justifications by saying, well, must have been conditional, must have been that, must have been this, must have been the other. Or Israel could have done that with all of the false prophets. Well, they must have meant, or I must have misunderstood, or people speak in plain language. We can hear, if we have any intelligence, just put the two together, and you know what they mean by what they say, and if it doesn't happen, you just reject it. But you see, people are put under bondage and fear by saying, well, you must have misinterpreted, or you must have, or you must have. God doesn't give the people of Israel that type of uh, tongue lashing. He, he puts all of the burden on the prophets. If, you go, if you're a prophet of mine, you're going to speak my heart and my word, and it will come to pass. He doesn't put the burden on the people like you've got to be sure that you interpret the prophecy rightly. He just says, listen, you people are smart, and if they say uh, on Tuesday such and such will happen and Wednesday comes and it didn't, then you reject them. That's how simple it is. But I hear people out there saying, not here in this church, but I hear people out there saying, ah, it's... That's too legalistic or, well, I don't know what else you can, if you don't have that view, then you know what you're open to. You're open to false prophets and prophetesses. That's all there is to it. You're open to people who give prophecies that are false, that don't come to pass, and you don't care. You keep on believing them anyway. And you're a strange case as far as I'm concerned because that's not what the Bible, either the New or the Old Testament, has to say about prophecy and, and revelation. 
And, you know, maybe, just listen to me here on this for a moment, maybe some of us, maybe the reason we don't see so many dreams and visions is because some of us have been spooked by all the rest of that corruption and that nonsense and that business going on out there. Because when you hear every Mary and Larry has a dream and a vision and none of it's ever coming to pass, then you get spooked about the whole matter. I'm not saying that you should. I'm just saying sometimes that's probably what happens. You just kind of get a distaste in your mouth for someone standing up saying, I'm a prophet, when he's only about the 109th guy you've heard say that, and you've had to reject all of the others so far. So you're saying, okay, what's your angle now? All the rest of them have had an angle. What's your angle now? How many days am I going to have to give you before you put your foot in your mouth and give you enough rope that you hang yourself? We shouldn't have to have that attitude. But it almost ends up that being the attitude. So maybe people shouldn't be emphasizing all the supernatural so much. Emphasize something else for people to get their feet on the ground. Don't emphasize that because then they're going and looking and listening for every supernatural thing. And they're going to get deceived. People need to be emphasizing the word so that the sheep, the true believers, get really established there so that God does begin to communicate. I don't believe that knowledge gets in people's way. Maybe the spooks get in people's way. Knowledge doesn't get in your way. Knowledge helps increase your effectiveness in whatever you have to say. God delivers from a bunch of dummies who think that it's a virtue to be ignorant and dumb just so that I can say that the Lord gets all the glory. That's no virtue to be an ignoramus and dumb about spiritual or biblical matters. You can say, well, God gets all the praise that way. God gets the praise. We get the hard knocks on our head. You get the false prophecies. We're going to end up with all types of problems on our hands then. I don't exactly think that's what Paul's talking about in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Well, anyway, back to Ms. Schrader and her prophecies here i don't have any problem with this woman i don't know much about her so i can't have too much of a problem i don't believe in prophetesses i can say that i don't believe they have any new testament foundation so that's a problem but she's a believer got some gift of prophecy and so she prophesies well praise the lord bible teaches us and encourages us to desire to prophesy and to covet to prophesy so evidently she did so good well partially good the desire to prophesy is good but (laughs) <laughs> there, there, there are a whole lot of other things that have to be considered I don't know enough about the woman to comment on here all I'm commenting on is the fact that I've got books of her prophecies that antedate 1967 and four of them I've just got two out of uh, at least seven volumes of these printed up and, and just in these two I've got four prophecies of what? Gideon's army all I'm trying to show you is that did not come uniquely and originally to somebody in 1967. Now, it's not a problem that it didn't. I'm just trying to show you, though. I'm trying to show people the fact that this has roots back earlier. And here's then the major problem with terminology that I ended with last time, which looks like I'll end with this time again. We just went for full circle. The barring of terminology and concepts in itself, there's no problem with that. I said in itself. That means the borrowing per se. That means just with the concept of borrowing. I mean, God forbid, but maybe you hear a Christian scientist express a certain truth a little better than you've ever been able to, and you borrow his concept. Well, borrowing is borrowing. It doesn't matter really where you borrow from if it's the truth that you have. But here's the big problem. Whenever you carry over with the terminology, unscriptural concepts. Unscriptural concepts. You see, there have been other words borrowed down through the years in theology. Well, you borrowed some yourself. Don't you talk about the evidence of the baptism, the initial evidence? Well, where'd you get that in the Bible? The Bible never uses that phrase, initial evidence. You borrowed that from somebody else, didn't you? Sure, we all did. I don't know who I borrowed it from, and I don't know who they borrowed it from. I don't know who the first person was that used it. I'm glad somebody used it. That's a good way of saying what we're trying to say, that there's one particular thing that evidences the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Now, the baptism of the Spirit is more than speaking in tongues. We're saying there's one thing, and one thing only, one thing particularly, one thing initially. So you have to put that word in, that evidences it, and that speaking in tongues. So somebody used that phrase. The rest of us have borrowed it 
So the concept that we have borrowed with the terminology is that there is one biblical initial evidence for having received the baptism of the Holy Spirit and that's speaking in tongues. You borrowed not only the concept, or rather not only the terminology, but the concept behind it. And you know what? That although the terminology doesn't have any place in the Bible, the concept is biblical. So we can agree with both the concept and the terminology. Now, Greater Works Ministry, Manifestation of the Sons of God, Gideon's Army, Man-Child Overcomers, people are going to have to determine which of these um, words have biblical support, and that's really not the matter at the end of the day, which of these ideas, concepts, has biblical support? And to think, as some people do, that Gideon's army and all that that generally implies to people, greater works ministry, manifestation of the sons of God, that Gideon's army and all that it implies came uniquely and originally to us, the prophecy, and then a sermon based on that, a prophecy given to Brother Freeman in 1967, is simply not true. Now, if you don't want to believe the facts of history, then you can be like the communists and try to rewrite history. But we're going to at least give you, here's what the facts of history are, though. And when you know that he was influenced by Sister Schrader, then perhaps he got it from her. I know this, and he heard that from somebody else. Now, maybe that he had already heard that, and then one time he's in his study praying, and he's anointed of the Lord, and the Lord gives him a word. That's fine. I don't have any problem with that. I just gave you an example of that before, though. Sometimes you hear something two weeks ago or yesterday, and you find that word or that idea working itself into the prophecy that you give. Let's hope that all that's working itself in is anointed of the Lord, that he's taken something that comes from your own experience and has put his seal of approval upon it, has put his anointing upon it, and has chosen to use you in that way and to use it in that way. I mean, God often would use, think of the parables of Jesus or the potter and the wheel and the clay and the dirty cloth of Jeremiah and so forth. He would use experiences they had and then give them a prophecy through that. But you see, you can't, you can't bring over into the church or the move of God or his people. Among them, you can't bring over into that not only terminology, but unscriptural concepts that are brought over with that terminology. And, you know, you'll find something else. This is just for the record's sake. I find in one of these prophecies, it's on page 5, um, a prophecy about the 91st Psalm, which also has been very blessed in our groups, the teaching of the protection of Psalm 91. That was neither unique nor original to our groups. Well, see, I'm not disappointed at the end of the day. Psalm 91 is still in the Bible. I plan on believing it and confessing it. But I appreciate knowing that way. You, you see, it frees you up to, to at least say, now, listen, if this didn't come, maybe something else didn't, and maybe the something else that didn't come uniquely and originally actually is in violation of the teaching of the Word of God. Psalm 91 isn't. But I'm just giving you that as one example. Teach my people, the prophecy said to live, it was a lo long one, live under the protection of the 91st Psalm. Listen, friends, people need to do just a few more historical studies. These ideas, I'm going to end here with this tonight, these ideas and concepts were floating around in the 1950s and the 1960s before our movement, quote-unquote, ever got going. They were already there. They were already a part of the charismatic movement, as were a whole lot of other things. The Lord Jesus gifted and anointed Dr. Freeman to purge out most of, almost all of these unscriptural ideas and unscriptural elements that had come into the charismatic movement. That's what God used him for. That's how God anointed that man. He was able to take all of these various and diverse truths from various groups, whether this group charismatic or that group charismatic. He was anointed of the Lord to take those truths and bring them together, find support for them in the Word of God, and teach this as the way that God wants his church to go. That's how God used it. And praise God for that. But that wasn't like a unique, special, private immediate direct communication of revelation to brother freeman he had various contacts over the years with other people and you you just know yourself well enough to know you pick up other things being around other people and where he played a very significant role as far as i'm concerned is he was able to purge out a lot of the unscriptural things and a lot of the 
bad things of all that and show people, show us what the truth is in so many matters. At least in the, in the elementary, basic, foundational sense. And that has put all of us on a good, on a, basically a good rock and foundation. But see, we haven't finished. If we, if, if we had finished, if God were through, we wouldn't be here anymore. We'd be gone. That was like just a preparatory work that just covered some of the basics and there is a lot more that still needs to be said and done. Some things undone, like what we're talking about right now, and other things done. We're, we are not trying to deride uh, Brother Freeman or the ministry that he had, but we have to be fair. We have to be honest people. And we know, and other people should take note of this fact, that we all have to stand before the judgment seat of Christ and give an account for our doctrines and our words and our attitudes and our beliefs. And it does neither service to Jesus nor to the church to continue to repeat a lie or repeat the, um, the impression of a certain idea that is not totally accurate. Uh, it does neither service to God, it brings no glory to him, and does no service to the church, not to be willing to deal with some of these matters. I remember one time I had a minister in my study, this was back uh, a year or so ago, we were just making some initial attempts to reestablish uh, communications with a certain group because we felt that's what the Lord wanted us to do, and I still feel like that was his will for then, and we've done as much as we can do. It's just that we had no idea some of those people were involved in some of the things that we found out. You can't know until you reestablish contact with them. But anyway, I had a minister from this place in my study, and after a long talk that wasn't the most pleasant, but he had one question to ask me, and I just share this with you, and I'll share my response to him, and I'll share how things have developed since then. He said, well, what are you going to, what are you telling your people, and what are you going to tell them to do or to think or to say or whatever about Dr. Freeman's death? He was concerned about what are you going to tell them and what are you going to tell them to think and to say and so forth about it. And I said, I'm not telling them anything and I'm not telling them to think or say anything. Because that's where I was right at that time. Now, there is no way that you can deny the fact that there were certain significant problems with Dr. Freeman's death. But I felt it'd do more damage to our own group. I mean, if you're trying to get in contact with someone and then you bring all that up and point it all out, then you just break the contact that you just attempted to resume but I'll never forget I had one brother one of you brothers here in the body who came to me after several months had transpired and things were not working out and people were not being honest I thought people were going to be willing to be honest with some matters in the past and they were not willing to by the way his response whenever I told him that he just shook his head and said something like I can't give you a quote but something like that's good or fine or okay that didn't deal with the issue of Dr. Freeman's death, but he was glad I wasn't going to tell anybody anything about it. He, I just said, I'm not saying anything about it. And I didn't, not then. I did later on because something has to be said. Because somebody here came to me in the body and said, I'm so glad that you said something about his death that, hey, you can't die in faith. Because this brother here in the body said, because, you know, if we're believing the healing, the biblical healing message, and we're also being asked not to believe anything, just to be an empty skull, an empty head, whenever it comes to Dr. Freeman's death, then he said, there's something wrong, there's something hypocritical and something lying about that. I said, you're exactly right, brother. He said, I'm glad that you came out and said there was something wrong with his death because, because I was wondering, well, what are we going to do about this whole matter? Are we going to give up healing? You ought to give up one thing or the other, either give up trying to justify that experience or give up your healing message. What people would rather do, don't say anything about any of it. Just be quiet. His response was, that's good. Okay, fine. That's what he wanted me to do. Just don't say anything about it. Because if people question it, then people might, what? It might lead them to question some other things. And I've said before, praise the Lord, the people, the ministers in the Word of God, they weren't perfect men. They didn't claim to be. They didn't claim that the ministers in the 20th century would be perfect. But the Bible also doesn't hide their faults. Moses, the greatest prophet in the Old Testament, didn't go into the promised land. Why? Because he sinned and he smote the rock instead of speaking to it. The Bible doesn't hide that fact. 
And, and the, evidently, God never thought that if I tell people, if I let all the Jews know and Christians down through the centuries know that Moses sinned, and that's why he did, well, people are going to lose respect for Moses and probably start, stop reading the Pentateuch. God never thought because God is a God of truth. There's no lie with God. He cannot lie. He hates lies. All people who love and make a lie will have their part in the lake of fire. That's what John said in Revelation 21. All that love and make a lie are going to have a, their place in the lake of fire that burns with fire and brimstone forever and ever. God just went right ahead and let it be in Scripture why Moses couldn't end. Hey, I haven't lost any respect for Moses. I still believe what he wrote. But I can't follow people when people don't follow God. And I can't know when not to follow them if they try to hide when they're not following God. Then people are going to lead me astray. And God doesn't look very favorably upon that. Peter got rebuked to his face by Paul. Why? Because people were being led astray by Peter's dissimulation. It's even called that by Peter's dissimulation. Well, whenever the Jews will, he'll, he's going to withdraw whenever certain came from James because those are important people and those are Jew, Jewish Christians and they see that I'm eating with Gentiles and then I won't appear like I'm. And Peter's going through all this business right here and Paul said, I rebuked him to his face because he was to be blamed. And it had to be done because other people are watching Peter. And Paul said, other people are being carried right along with you. They're watching Peter, and Peter does this, so they do that, and they all end up missing God. Then. So David, the great king, committed adultery and murder. And God didn't say, well, he's a king, and I wouldn't want people not to read the book of Psalms that he wrote, so I'm not going to tell anybody about that. You just have to be able to be mature enough, that, and I think that we should be around here. By, evidently, some people aren't but mature enough so that if you find out a mistake in somebody's life, that you don't throw out everything good because you find a mistake. Or you're going to be throwing out, I guess, that'd be Genesis through Revelation. God's real faithful to <clears throat> reveal that to us, so I don't think that we should shirk our responsibilities there either. Praise the Lord. Well, <clears throat> I had no idea I would be saying all that tonight, so maybe next time. <laughs> Saints, maybe next time. <clears throat> I still do want to give you some historical background to the movement. We just haven't gotten to that. I have decided to follow
Father, we just thank you and rejoice tonight that you've set your son before us as our pattern, as our example. He is the initiator. He is the author and the finisher of our faith. We plan on following him. We plan on keeping our eyes on him. We're going to keep our eyes on Jesus so we don't sink in this world of doubt and turmoil. But we're going to be overcomers. We're going to overcome by faith. We're going to be victorious. We're going to win. We're going to be raptured in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.